So a very good morning to all of you. And uh, it's wonderful to uh, have this uh, panel out here where we're going to talk about what is the, how India is going to be digitally elevating its Indian population. And uh, particularly, I think the pandemic, one thing it has sort of put the nail very hard into the wall is that today, either you are going to be a technology business or you're going to be a technology enabled business. There's really not going to be a very third kind of uh, opportunity that will exist. Uh, now, indeed, the digitization drive that the Indian government had started back in 2014 has already been uh, has already increased. And the last figure that I read is that today India's internet economy contributes about uh, more than 3% to the Indian GDP in various forms. And the role of services and IT has, of course, increased in the GDP play. I think where we have seen the greatest impact of digitization before the pandemic was really in three to four areas. One, of course, the e-procurement that the government had started, it had reduced the entire uh, fraud. It had been led to better management of resources, less wastage, and also, of course, better uh, subsidy distribution by the government. Um, of the, the payments, and I think the government's drive, it started with new monetization um, and uh, to build a cashless economy also had come a long way uh, before the pandemic. And of course, in the pandemic, it has um, further uh, accelerated and grown only because um, of the contactless kind of economy that has come to happen. Uh, tax regime, of course, has got simplified, which has again helped people and businesses in a very large way. But I think what the pandemic has done more importantly, it has brought forth or um, brought to the fore those opportunities which were there in technology but were lying low because of their adoption. So whether it was education or whether it was um, how businesses could, uh, you know, sort of go forward digitally, it has all now accelerated and grown to a very large extent. So I have a wonderful panel over here today who is going to tell us what is the opportunities they say they see today um, from a government's perspective as well as from startups perspective and how digitization would further enhance in India. So let me start with uh, Secretary Jayesh Ranjan who is here with us today. Um, good morning, sir. And, uh, you know, so government of India has been very uh, rapidly trying to put out or take out some uh, areas or deliver on areas where you know, digitization could happen. Now, given that pandemic is here, how do you uh, see digitization adoption happening further and what is government going to work with? Uh, thank you, Ritu. Good morning, uh, fellow panelists. So, as you rightly said, the push towards uh, digitalization has been happening for the last uh, few years and this uh, demonetization was a very important uh, milestone in that lots of digital payments but definitely the covid uh, scenario has given a completely new thrust to digitalization let me talk about the uh, three important areas which are very very important for the government i mean these are in some ways government's core functions one is to provide education or enable education second is to provide healthcare third is to skill the people who are going to join the workforce now, in, uh, I'll, I'll give you the example of uh, Telangana, the state that I represent. Uh, all the private schools in this state, in the city of Hyderabad, where I'm speaking from, they have started online classes for almost 15-20 uh, days, uh, classes are going on. But none of the government schools in the state, and there are almost 20,000 plus government schools, they have not been able to start anything because they are just not prepared. How do you enable... Uh, connectivity in remote areas of course government schools as you would know are in uh, nooks and corners of the state so how do you provide connectivity secondly how do you ensure that everyone has access to a device as you would uh, understand there are lots of poor families who send their children to these schools and not many of them can have access to a uh, smart device so that is a very big challenge healthcare is again a very important thing as all of us know the entire focus of the healthcare machinery is on this covid management Cases, unfortunately, are rising both in Telangana and at the national level. So we are seeing one more uh, phenomena, which is that non-COVID related diseases and ailments are not getting that kind of priority. So if you are having some other problem, the chances are of uh, chances are very less that you will get uh, access to some high quality institution and high quality doctors. So what are the alternatives? We know that models exist. There are very sharp uh, telemedicine options, teleconsultation options, but the government is just not ready for, uh, prepared for all these things. So definitely this COVID pandemic will force us to relook. So you spoke about Digital India. Digital India suggests connecting all the villages, but we need to go more. We have to have a system 
wherein every home is connected as rapidly as possible. Digital India talks about uh, digital literacy, but again, we have to ensure that that the pace of that program is enhanced. Plus, we also need to create uh, common infrastructure. So even if I don't have access to a device in my home, I have the wherewithal to seek uh, common infrastructure somewhere. And this is very, very important because uh, if you have to reap the benefits of the demographic dividend, we must ensure that the digitization push doesn't cause a digital divide in our country. Those who are better off, who are in cities, who speak English, they benefit and rest of them are left behind. So digital infrastructure, digital literacy, providing digital solutions, these are very important. And the time has come, governments have started realizing it, that they have to work very closely with the private sector, with the startups, incentivize them, create an enabling environment for them to fill up some of these gaps which the government has not been able to do by itself. So, I mean, particularly from a government's perspective, what do you think three to four areas where there's going to be a bigger push that is going to happen in the forthcoming days? Yes. So, uh, Digital India, the way it has been conceptualized so far, the way it has rolled, rolled out in the last uh, six years, there is a component called BharatNet. BharatNet requires you to provide connectivity, good quality, high speed connectivity, up to the village headquarter, the panchayat headquarter that is. I am very sure that that will change. I mean, as a government, we ourselves have been writing and speaking to Government India to expand the scope of BharatNet to ensure that every home gets connected. And fortunately, in Telangana, much before this COVID, we had, the, we had the foresight that we must do that. And therefore, we have a program in our own digital Telangana called T-Fiber in which we are connecting. But earlier, our plan was to connect every home over a two years period. Now, given the scenario, we want to cut it short to 10 months. In 10 months, we want to connect every home. The other important thing is, which I'm sure everyone else in the panel will also recognize that even if you provide a broadband optic fiber cable right till my doorstep, there'll be thousands and thousands of people who are not going to be enamored with it. It is not that in the morning I wake up, someone tells me that, hey, there is broadband at your doorstep and I rush out and buy a device, I buy a laptop, I buy a smartphone. I mean, there are thousands of people, first of all, who will not really value what this broadband is about. And secondly, who don't have uh, the means to afford a device, etc. It's very important that we use this time very productively. And as I said, education opportunities are there, healthcare law opportunities are there, skilling opportunities are there to provide solutions which matter to the people and give these solutions to, before their eyes. They should see the difference that without technology, someone else is languishing behind. And with the help of technology, someone else is flourishing. And if you are able to show these kind of solutions, which make a difference to the lives of the common people before they arrive, then only they will value technology. And tomorrow when you create digital infrastructure, there will be a buy-in from their side to either procure that infrastructure or use it in some common facility. So creating that digital infrastructure, very robust infrastructure right in the doorstep and providing convincing solutions, which creates that buy-in from the people. These will be two important priorities for the government as days go by. Sure. We'll come back again to you, Mr. Dungeon, but let me jump on to uh, Mr. Keshav. Now, Mr. Keshav, you were, when the lockdown really started with the pandemic, you were the chairman of uh, IT, PTM industry for the Epic Sporty NASCOM. And you've probably seen within the IT industry the biggest shift that has happened to work from home. And in industries where this work from home was not possibly happening at the pace it was required, um, there has been a big job loss happened uh, in the course of time. So what I would really like for you to elaborate is that do you think that work from home is going to be a go-to culture in the IT industry? How do you think it is going to change the way entire uh, industry now looks at remuneration to um, employee management to new sort of, it would completely bring new sort of uh, policies for uh, uh, people uh, which have existed in the industries and how do you foresee that happening? That is one. And secondly, a lot of people who have lost job, who were, I would say, not uh, involved in the IT industry. Now, how can we upskill those people very quickly and get them into new jobs that they are getting, getting created in the industry? So we'd love to know your thoughts on this. Sir. Well, thank you, Ritu. And it's so nice to be part of this panel uh, that has such distinguished people, including some personal heroes of mine. Jay Ranjan is a hero. And I'll tell you why a little later. Srikanth is a hero to the IT industry. I'll tell you during my story why. 
And I can tell you, I want to first start with a tone of confidence in terms of how the Indian IT industry actually responded to a pandemic for which probably there was no BCP ever thought of by anybody, right? We had maybe three and a half hours to plan for probably what I think is the biggest ever shift of a business model and what we kept speaking about over the years in terms of you know, different ways of transforming clients, we actually, if you ask me, brought forward the future in a matter of a few days, if or if not a few hours, by overnight moving the entire model from work from office to work from home. Now, first thing I want to say is the speed and alacrity with which the government and the industry body like NASCOM responded to the situation. You know, the first thing is the prime minister of the country himself tweeted saying that we will support this industry to the hilt. The IT minister did the same and provided all support. Every state government, you know, including Jayesh Ranjan himself, came forward. They helped us declare this industry as an essential service first. Thereafter, they enabled all of us to uh, to create this e-passes so that three to three and a half million desktops could be shifted from offices to home, right? So you can just imagine the complexity in a lockdown situation, doing this, keeping the lights on for our clients, ensuring that the safety of our four and a half million employees was focused on, and at the same time, loosening cyber and other controls and very quickly thereafter, tightening all those controls to make sure that the clients did not see at all any negative impact. Again, I must say, this gives a lot of confidence in terms of how India has matured, how this industry and its people have delivered. And while we have spoken about so many things and we saw so many challenges across different industries, did we hear of even one challenge relating to this industry? Right. Not a single one. So that's the first thing I want to uh, underline outside the demand is still, you know, in flux because only now countries are starting to open up and only now we are starting to see ports start to open up. And therefore, over a period of time, a new normal, you know, will will uh, emerge. But the way we worked with the government in terms of policy, you know, extending and, you know, asking for relaxations on Department of Telecom norms, uh, work from home norms, special economic zone norms, now working with them in terms of diluting the labor laws so that we can make work from home as a new normal. Now, let me mention that the most important aspect to appreciate is COVID-19 did not happen in India or Asia alone. It happened globally. It happened at the same time to everybody. So the appreciation of what the industry did and the fact that this industry can take on uncertainty in such a mature manner is now very well known. And therefore, I think a lot of clients are actually saying there are parts and components of business that can now be delivered from home. And therefore, we would be very happy to do it. The rest can come back to the office. So work from home, in my view, will be a long term blended input into you know into the overall model uh, now in terms of just how the overall situation is emerging if you think about it india has always spoken about tier 2 tier 3 tier 4 locations and saying move the model there uh, mr ranjan just now spoke about how fiber is moving to all of these places and therefore what is the opportunity there the reality is if we are able to amend some of these, you know, older, very old labor laws, our ability to take this model into tier two, tier three, tier four locations first. Second thing is to access part time workers and enable the gig economy is extremely high. And I can tell you, it will allow us to access the 120 million women who have a secondary education in India, but today are not part of any workplace because they want a part time job. Right. We are now going to enable that. So it's a big, big opportunity. If you ask me from our point of view across the globe, we are seeing trends like 
we saw reverse migration of labor in India. We are hearing of reverse globalization, though Kenichi Ome said, oh, it's a borderless world. The reality is lots of leaders are saying go local, right? At the same time, protectionism is raising its, its head. From our perspective as an industry, I think what we want to send out as a signal is we are investing in great people, great technologies, the most updated business models, and therefore for any company or any country to completely transform themselves and keep moving up the value chain in terms of digital models, India is the place to go to for the long term as well. You mentioned something about job losses. The reality is at this point in time, we have not seen you know, the scale of job losses in this industry that you may have seen in the other industries. In fact, I will say that this industry has been extremely disciplined in terms of holding on to its people. The larger companies actually have made huge sacrifices to hold on to these people. But if the pandemic goes on for a very, very long time, we'll have to make the course corrections. But remember, we are changing our models in such a format that it becomes much more digital oriented. So people will get elevated to different kinds of uh, jobs. Technology will take over some other. And because we're investing so much in skilling models and upskilling models, particularly about some of the areas that uh, Mr. Ranjan spoke about and Srikant will talk about later, you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning, cognitive thing uh, areas and stuff like that. India will continue to be a very, very important area where jobs will still be created. Uh, businesses will be transformed by us. And we will continue to grow our revenues once COVID-19 is over and done. Yeah, indeed, Mr. Keshav, I think rightly put, the IT industry has probably been the only industry which has seen lesser impact. And also, of course, uh, therefore, a uh, lot less uh, and big resilience, I would say, in one sense, uh, faced by the pandemic, while other industries are still trying to cope to it. So let me uh, shift on to Shrikant here. Now, Shrikant, um, you know, before the session started, you and I were talking about how uh, how people are going to sort of now change or look into a different direction of uh, working uh, going forward. We have such a huge population and then some population is sitting off in remote areas who now don't want to come to big cities to come and work. But that doesn't make the work of the government any easier because everybody needs to look for employment opportunities. And as Mr. Kesha pointed out, that the gig economy is something that is here to stay. How can we include people? How can it become more inclusive? How can more people be involved in the gig economy and in the employment structure of this new normal? And where do you see opportunities sort of coming forward? And, and I mean, largely, what would you advise to people today who have lost jobs, who are not in IT industry or not directly related to IT? How could they now be looking at opportunities for the next five to seven years to be able to uh, create a, a source of income for themselves? Please unmute. Thank you, Ritu. That's a lot of questions. <laughs> uh, I, I will start by saying that the basic concept of uh, India's demographic dividend or population dividend essentially is that in the next 10 years, by 2030, we would have added another 91 million people to the labor workforce, people between 15 and 16, whereas the rest of the world would have deducted 74 million people. Like India is a net talent supplier to the world right, in the next 10 years. right, And that is both a phenomenal opportunity as well as a major risk. And I'll tell you why. right? In the last 50 years, World economy has grown by an average of 3% because it has half and half, three and a half percent, half of it, about 1.7% came because of population or employment growth. And the remaining half came from productivity growth. Really, there, there are only two ways in which an economy can grow, employment growth and productivity growth. Now, productivity growth has come to some kind of a halt because, you know, late, more and more recent technologies haven't really increased productivity. So most of the world is actually flowing on employment, growing on employment growth. And the next 50 years, what happens if AI automates everything? Employment growth doesn't happen, but maybe productivity growth will happen. And if employment growth is the future of growth, then India is a net supplier of that talent to the world. So it's a huge opportunity. But the risk is, what if productivity growth happens through AI and, and technology, and really there is no uh, no real employment growth, right? And that's the risk. Right? India has a lot of low-wage, uh, low-skilled jobs, which are seen by many as potentially being lost in that. So how does India play play and really upskill its talent 
So there are medium skill, high skill jobs can be created for India in the next 10 to 20 years. Like imagine in the next 30 years, like from 2020 to 2050, India keeps growing by 5, 6% and the rest of the world grows by 2 or 3%. India is going to be much larger share of the world economy than today. That is a, that's a fact. We have to enable that from that to happen. And that, for that, I think what we have to also fundamentally look at is what will be the future of work? Because if future of work, like you said, gig economy is big, big. If future of work involves uh, people not really working, but actually technology playing a much larger role, then we have to see how this whole thing plays out. That's where the risks are. Now, uh, in general, the first question we'll ask is, Does is there a real value of a 40-hour work week? The big question, if you look at 150 years ago, people used to work on an average 70 to 80 hours a week. In the last 150 years, that has gone down to 40. And there is no good reason that 40-hour work week will actually work. It might actually come down. People might actually work less. Right? Therefore, countries, I mean, you've seen Korea, the countries like Korea, Japan, worked very hard in the 50s and 60s and created a beautiful economy for them for the next generation. This is now a time for India to create that economy for the next 20, 30, 50 years. Right? And therefore, what does India need to do? First, I think is upskilling. Right? India needs to really upskill its talent talent force. That means we have to really invest in things like ed education technology, ed tech, right? So that world ed education is available to Indians, but it's just that we need to build the pipelines. Since Geo has come in, India's internet consumption has really increased to almost globally comparable levels. And in, on mobile internet, India is highest in the world. So per capita consumption, right? Therefore, it can it can really use that underlying infrastructure to create education to, and create what kind of education. It's the traditional education is not going to work. The jobs of the future will involve create the critical thinking and problem solving skills, right? To understand that there is no one right answer to any question. The idea of ethical leadership, learning to learn. How, what are those uniquely human skills? The uniquely human skills are compassion, creativity, empathy, humor, right? Adaptability, originality. How do we teach our kids these things so then the next 20 years the new kind of jobs which involve much more right brain thinking whole brain thinking will be india will be ready to to to, to play in that's number one number two is should we we have to invest in our infrastructure unless we have the geo infrastructure privately invested but is really helping india right now but what about the roads infrastructure what about health infrastructure india is also getting population will get older in the next 20 30 years india will need much more health care than now so how do we invest in health tech in a way that can actually boost the economy. India has the low, one of the lowest doctors to uh, citizens uh, ratio. But if with, with the right amount of technology, for example, AI technology in, in radiology and imaging and so on, if we can actually make sure that our doctors are far more productive and are able to do a lot more work. And therefore, they create all these other jobs. Once you have the doctors spending less and less time on doing the mundane admin things, more jobs can be created. because, And that's where the technology and human beings can come together. That's a second. That's a second angle, which is about investing in the in the future, investing in infrastructure for the future. And the third for me is entrepreneurship. Eventually, jobs will be created because there are a great number of entrepreneurs in our country. How do we create an investment ecosystem for the entrepreneurs? And how do we create a culture where failure is okay? How do we create a more? How can more capital come in? How do we help our very small and uh, medium enterprises? Right? Think like. Big companies, right? Startup, there's no difference between a startup and a small enterprise, except that the startup is thinking very big and acting very fast. But the small small and medium enterprise is thinking small and actually continuing to just subsist. Right? That's really, if we can convert some of our, our nation of shopkeepers into nation of entrepreneurs, it will become, I think, we will deliver the future. So really, those are some of the ideas that I had in how we can elevate the demographic dividend of, of India. Sure. No, I think you, you made a very valid point of saying that, you know, everybody now needs to start thinking like something that they are doing, which is everyday work to thinking larger and therefore being able to uh, elevate themselves uh, to the digital economy. Um, Shawin, let me ask you this. I mean, you know, um, you build this platform uh, around the world and how do you feel communities coming uh, and adding value in the coming times? So what is going to be the importance of communities um, in the times to come? Please unmute. Uh, thank you so much for having me and thank you for using Around the World for this event, really appreciate it. Uh, so the things that we have seen, we've seen, seen a quite a lot of trend uh, since the last three months. 
you know, since the coronavirus. Uh, one is we see there's a lot of events that are happening on a global scale. Uh, 90% of the events host, uh, hosted around the world um, have uh, more than at least one country, uh, like more than three countries participating in those events. Uh, we see actually a large population of, of Indian um, Indians, uh, entrepreneurs or technologists that are doing a lot of events hosted by Silicon Valley um, you know, entrepreneurs. So there's a lot of collaboration uh, on a global scale that we see uh, are happening online. You know, it's actually happening quite uh, more uh, than than in, re uh, in in real life because now you don't need to travel. There is no visa uh, limitations. So we see most of the events are happening on a global scale, meaning that people can now meet other people uh, who share the similar expertise or similar interests, but from a different country. They otherwise wouldn't have the time to to meet or the opportunity to collaborate. Now they are talking about doing projects together. Now they are talking about what's new in your country, what's new in my country. Now they are talking about finding jobs directly through those online experiences that that, that are happening today. So that's one thing, and we actually see an overwhelming number of uh, you know um, people from India uh, or people from Brazil, people from China uh, that are participating in those events. Historically, that was more maybe European started or American started. And we see a lot of population from, from emerging countries. Actually, that's great. It levels the a playing field for a lot of people, uh, you know, where the location is no longer uh, a, a blocking factor. Uh, so that's the one thing that we see. Uh, the second that we see is where people are now trying to find solutions to build deeper, meaningful social interactions online. Um, historically, you know, we have social media like WhatsApp or Facebook or Messenger, uh, where the type of interaction among community members are pretty shallow. It's just posting a comment, liking somebody's comment, or heart emoji somebody's articles. Now we're seeing this video first world where people like us can have a conversation uh, that feels like a real life conversation that is no longer just, you know, you post a sentence, I like it. Uh, instead, it's a back and forth discussion uh, that really enhances our relationship. Uh, it builds more trust. It also enables people to start relationship in a way that they didn't expect to do. Uh, in fact, we see more introverts are now actively participating in online experiences because they no longer need to reach out to somebody in a large conference hall trying to find the topic uh, and figure out who to talk to. Uh, instead, now that through data, for example, we have a networking comp component that can recommend people or show you the relevant people who share the similar keywords as you. So, so the matchmaking or the networking piece become more natural online uh, to, to for some introverts who otherwise will find it really intimidating. So we see that the relationship building piece is also uh, where seeing a massive change. Uh, then the third thing about the community I really wanted to stress is we're seeing that, you know, events is no longer a one-time thing. You know, historically, we talk about going to a conference once a year uh, or maybe once a quarter. Uh, and then people go to this conference hall, they form community, they get to know each other, uh, then they leave. Uh, you know, th because they have to fly back home. Um, but now because it's online, so the type of interaction you have after one event is more recurrent events because it's so easy and so uh, it's much cheaper uh, to organize an event. Uh, so there are more events available. It's much easier uh, and more convenient to attend events. So the friction of flying somewhere to go to that event is also dropping. Uh, as a result, we see a lot of the conferences where events are happening recurrent on a recurring basis. The organizers say, I'm going to do something once a month. I'm going to do something every two weeks. And the same group of people who otherwise only have met one time a year now are meeting every month or meeting every other week. And they are forming relationship, not only just business card, but also because they are meeting so often, uh, they're able to have deeper conversation where say, hey, nice to see you last month. And here, here are we again. So we see a lot of those deepened and uh, relationship got maintained online too. Uh, so we see a lot of changes, I think, to summarize is greater for uh, emerging country, uh, not only just something reserved for the U.S. or, or Europe, but also across the, the world. Uh, it levels the playing field for people who are more introvert to have the similar type of interactions. And also it in, enhances more uh, recurring uh, events that can foster and strengthen relationships. Sure. Thanks, Xiaoyin. I think uh, you certainly sort of somebody else also agrees with you from our audience. Uh, Francis has written that this is, of course, a different time for networking and business events. Um, uh, so, you know, Conrad, on the same note, let me ask you this. 
Do you think uh, with business networking now coming on to a video and people now able to talk much more um, and, you know, they can, they can just get over a video call and they get so much that they can discuss and talk about, which was, in fact, a little difficult uh, to do earlier. So what what kind of new influences you think are going to come out of um, this pandemic and, you know, what kind of new people are going to be the faces of uh, that media is going to look at once the pandemic is we're really out of it. And uh, right now, of course, we're amidst it. Yeah. No, absolutely. I, I, I think there are um, uh, kind of uh, going to be a ton of new opportunities for new influencers. I think if, if it's OK, um, uh, one of the uh, a, I, it's fantastic to be on this session with with all of you. I think, um, you know, the more that I uh, kind of spend time on this issue, um, you, you know, you think about the digital divide in, in India, obviously being a really important issue. I, I believe India ranked, I think it was 122nd globally for Internet penetration, about, you know, about half the country not having access to Internet. And then you you know you think about about COVID nineteen uh, how it's kind of going to further this this, uh, this kind of in- inequity there. Um, I was actually the, the more I looked into it, the more you know you see. Uh, for example, I think there was a study that showed that three out of every four uh, students felt that they were going to be really severely impacted by by online education. Um, so you, so you just you see this enormous divide and and how that can kind of compound. And um, uh, I, I feel like the best thing I, I'm the CEO of a company called Publicize, but the best way I could kind of contribute to, to the conversation is um, uh, part of the time when I would travel and visit these different governments and countries, I would author these articles for TechCrunch. So you get these opportunities to interview a lot of give government leaders and startup founders and see like, hey, well, what are the best practices that actually governments have done? And, and most international organizations, whether it's Microsoft for startups or Oxford University or Stanford or government of Puerto Rico, I, I advise on technology and my hope was to kind of share a couple of data points that I felt like, um, you know, that that I, I felt would be important for India to, pr- to potentially adopt in the future. Because when you have this large inequity, and obviously that's going to increase because of COVID nineteen, people are going to look, have looked, and will increasingly look for government to play an important role there. And um, um, you know, three three thoughts that that had come to mind were um, of uh, f- first, when I think of India and, and its government looking to adopt best practices from governments, so not looking to reinvent the wheel. And, and just as one example, when I think about emerging markets and uh, kind of uh, digital innovation, et cetera, um, one that comes to mind as a success story is, is the government of Chile and kind of their um, their most popular and most well-known program is something called Startup Chile. And the idea for it is essentially they would give out these grants of $40,000 uh, U.S. dollars for startups to start new programs and start new companies, et cetera. And um, it became it became very successful. I think to date, over 1,600 startups have gone through technology companies. It's uh, close to $1.5 billion portfolio valuation. Actually, just in sales, they've made over, their companies have made $300 million. And I remember visiting the government. It was actually Startup Chile's from a government organization called Corfo. And you go there and you think like, this is such a fantastic program. But of course, you got you have spent so much money on this, you know. And actually, it was really interesting talking to the government. They said, "No, you, Connor, you don't understand. Chile is a part, for example, of thirty-seven uh, OECD member countries. They spend the least amount of money on research and development. By far, the, they spend 037 percent of their entire budget. Actually, Startup Chile, which is one of the government's most the the world's most popular program, their annual budget." Was between seven to nine million dollars, which is almost, which is a, it's a fraction. When you think about how much government spends. So, and and it, it was really interesting because you'd go to these different um, kind of successful programs. Then you think about Parallel 18 from from Puerto Rico, and then you go to ones, for example, in Mexico or Brazil, where they're spending so much more money and actually receiving fewer results. And I would just kind of hone in on, hey, what are the specific things that the successful government programs are doing, and how can India adopt some? And and a handful that come to mind. For example, is that the, the most successful programs, actually, they, they made a very concerted effort from the very beginning to actually separate themselves from the government ministry. So, so actually, they'd have a very independent organization that operated it. And it felt like because of that, they really separated themselves from this bureaucracy. I think the second is they used constraints as a force and function to innovate. So actually, the, the, the reason for success wasn't because they had a lot of money. It was actually they didn't have a lot of resources, so they had to innovate. I think the, the third was, do we able to integrate international and local communities very effectively via mentorship, via courses, engagement? They actually recruited this. The, the, if you look at their executive team, in general, they recruited their team members from the startup ecosystem, not 
kind of the political environment, which, which I found was really interesting. But just to go back, I, if I had to think about India, hey, w- what could they do as a, as a government to get involved? I would say, you know, don't look to reinvent the wheel, look to adopt the best practices from these really effective countries. Um, I'm happy to go further into that in the future. I think that the second is look to leverage at scale these these leading in, innovation organizations, these platforms, et cetera. Um, one that comes to mind just as an example, I mentioned I help uh, Oxford University. They have a, a Rhodes Scholar who founded this nonprofit called Give Funds that's actually looking to, to basically uh, unlock sustainable capital for social enterprises. And um, in some ways, it's almost kind of a Grameen Bank 2.0 about, hey, how can you actually use the financial markets, leverage those, but for social uh, f- for kind of social loans at scale, et cetera. So, hey, what, what are these platforms that can support? And it kind of leads into actually the, the third and kind of last point was, I remember um, uh, I'd raised funding for my first startup in Silicon Valley. I remember moving to New York when it was, this was in 2009. And uh, back then, actually, the ecosystem was really young. Like now New York's is tech capital. But back then, uh, it, was, it was just kind of up and coming. And uh, Michael Bloomberg uh, would always talk, um, the, the mayor would always say, hey, the biggest role that actually the government could play is being a uh, cheerleader for kind of for for innovation, for digital, for for technology, et cetera. And um, uh, one of the things that I, I found was really important because, um, and, and actually uh, Srikanth made a really good point about this uh, this earlier, when you think about this, this large divide is um, I do believe part of it, um, you know, as like as increasingly the population increases and, and these these issues arise, part of it is going to be part, like, how does India further culture of kind of giving back to to this new, you know, to, to others, et cetera. Um, and I think Silicon Valley has done a really good job of of almost reinforcing that every business class you go to from the very you know from first class to the end was always um, uh, hey, uh, you're going to become successful. We believe in you. We're going to support you, and and we are going to expect you're going to give back and support kind of the next generation. So th- thanks so much for, yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, those are just a, a, a few points that have come to mind uh, for, for, you know, sure. for, for the topic. Sure. Thanks, Conrad. You know, we've also got some questions uh, flowing from our uh, listeners. Um, so there's Dr. Mithilesh who's asking that can India's workforce have a safe return to business? Um, you know, uh, Mr. Jayesh, uh, Keshav, what would you like your uh, take on this? See, uh, as all of us uh, know about India, most of the economic activities are now back on track. All the offices are allowed to open, businesses are allowed to open, factories are allowed to open. And in Telangana, for example, we have removed all restrictions. So there is no restriction on the number of employees who can go to the office. There's no restriction on timing. So you can even have night shifts and all that. Of course, with all the precautions and all the norms that need to be followed. So... That is uh, on, on the one part. But the second part is that how safe are we able to get, ma- make them feel? What is the overall environment like? So we know that uh, we have large number of cases uh, happening again post the uh, unlock period also. And uh, there is a sense of alarm that perhaps things are not as uh, controlled as they should have been. So technology possibly can give us a very good direction on what kind of uh, opening should happen. So since Srikanth is in the panel, I can share this with you, that we have taken help of, and uh, since Mr. Keshav is also there, he till recently was the president of NASCOM. So we have uh, taken help of a NASCOM task force. There is a NASCOM task force. Srikanth is one of the leaders of that task force, which has done a very sophisticated uh, predictive analysis tool, a database tool, which can tell you what will be the way in which the infection will spread, what kind of transmission will happen. And fortunately, in Telangana, the answers that we got from this tool was that most of the spread will continue to happen within the containment zone. So, so people, so zones there, already large number of cases are there. So uh, <clears throat> since we knew that, we have been able to permit uh, opening of uh, offices without any restrictions, etc. And that strategy has worked well. Businesses have gone as normal. And uh, so far, the lockdown uh, was removed uh, on uh, 1st of June. Today is uh, 22nd. In the last three weeks or so, I don't think we have got any case at all in any of our industrial parks or IT parks and so on and so forth. So as long as there is some rationale behind your decision making, some science behind your decision making, you should feel safe and allow things to get back to normal as early as we can. And Ritu, if I may just add to that, because yeah. I saw that the third question is addressed to me as well. 
So I'll tell you, I think the industry has been extremely disciplined in terms of planning this trifecta, what I call the trifecta. One is ensuring the uh, health and safety of our employees, keeping the lights on for our clients. And the third is actually planning the return to work. You know, thanks to Mr. Jayesh and others, we actually have a 50% approval to return to work, actually, the Indian industry. But... The tech industry is so cautious and so careful because they believe that people are so important that in a very careful, planned manner, we are slowly bringing people back uh, to the office. So in some cases, some of the large companies, when I was talking to them, less than 10% actually are back in the office. But more importantly, I think what I want to mention is every company has got SOPs in place in terms of how do people... Employees actually travel to the office when the return happens. How do they operate inside the office? What are the hygiene and social distancing norms to be followed? How uh, facilities will be used? Cafeterias will be used? How they will travel in case of essential travel that is required? And how they will handle crisis in case something happens? Because see, we must remember, this is not something that is going to disappear in a hurry. We have to wait till, you know, some kind of a, a vaccine is available. So we are very mature about the fact that we will put all of this in place. We will work closely with the government and we will keep ensuring that this trifecta we never lose sight of. Sure. Uh, Shrikant, just to sort of add to what you earlier asked uh, and, you know, and of course, this question about uh, returning, taking a safe return to business. Now, there, there's going to be a big difference uh, between returning to business and being able to find your business uh, as per your pre-pandemic days. Now, what, what kind of shifts do you would, would you like to see happening in businesses so that they are able to sort of find their feet in ground on uh, stay afloat, um, you know, as, as days goes on? You may have seen this very interesting meme that's been uh, going on. What created, uh, what accelerated digital transformation and the options are CEO, CIO and COVID-19. And the right option is COVID-19. Right? That's that's really what's happening. I mean, it, it really captures the essence of what has been happening. COVID-19 has really accelerated the adoption of digital technologies across the world, which is, I think, in a, in a, in a very, very positive thing that has come out of this, right? We are preparing ourselves for the next pandemic, right? And we are. It, it means that things like the things potentially the investments around, for example, moving to the cloud. People were very reluctant. Is it more expensive? It, it's it's a big project and so on. People are lock, stock, and barrel moving their workloads to cloud, and 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 that's one one big thing we're seeing. So there's a rise for rise for rise for demand uh, rise for talent like uh, data engineering is becoming really important because you want to make sure that. All your data can flow into the cloud seamlessly and you can make decisions on the fly. That's big, become big. Similarly, overall, uh, what we have seen is for, uh, all digital technologies, including AI, have really gotten a lot of demand. Now, because people are saying, look, uh, this does anyone earlier it was a discretionary expense. It's still a discretionary expense. But now people think that investments in AI are mission critical. Right? Because unless we are able to connect, digitally connect, uh, the organization and able to and are able to run it in a virtual mode literally right when people are not able to talk to each other it's all virtual mode in virtual mode if you have to run the organization then we need better technologies like ai so we have seen a big shift towards those kinds of technologies and of course you know we are all in in virtual mode right now so obviously these kinds of technologies also also shaping up so what it means is that with every crisis there are new opportunities that always come up it's about finding those new opportunities and organizations have to work towards those opportunities. That's how they can recover growth because the, the world has changed. The cheese has moved. We have to move with the cheese. Correct. <laughs> yeah, I know. You put, you've put quoted the right, uh, right, no, uh, the right book at the right place, I would say. Uh, Mr. Ranjan, there's a question that has come for you. There's that where does Telangana stand in context of internet penetration and surge of internet usage in the view of COVID-19? See, the internet penetration is uh, definitely not, not as much as we would have liked to have, particularly in a situation like this. But as I said, we have a very ambitious pro project called T-Fiber, which will ensure that connectivity is provided to every household. And this is a very, very ambitious goal. In fact, we'll become the first state in the country to be able to do this. So 
that is where our plans are and we will achieve it in the next 10 months sure um uh, i think our, our time is really up so one very one very quick final word from all of you um starting with you mr keshav uh, mr ranjit uh, to the how we can make our improve digitization in this country so definitely definitely this is a very important imperative for all of us and uh, for the new normal in the world this is a very big priority and let us take it with utmost serious seriousness and a sense of responsibility sure mr keshav you know i will say that india has always leveraged every one of these crises or pand pandemics to create a completely new opportunity in this panel we spoke about education infrastructure taking the you know talent to tier 2 tier 3 you can just imagine what's going to happen at the end of all of this uh, these investments being made india will continue to rule the roost we will continue to do extremely well and i am very bullish about the long term future um mr shrikant please unmute mr shrikant sorry about that uh, i will echo what jayesh and keshav have already said this is a big crisis unavoidable unfortunately it has happened but the opportunity that comes out of this is huge and india can take advantage of that be the net supplier of talent and capabilities to the world i think this is the, we, we we can do it sure uh, conrad shawin I mean the the last statement he made about the cheese was just so good. I I can't follow up on that. <laughs> no, but um no, I I just want to reiterate I think uh there is a lot of adversity. I think um uh, there are so many great data points to pull whether it's from other countries and uh and organizations to and kind of adopt those best practices. And I mean Ritu and and the panel I just want to thank you. It's it's just been fantastic speaking to you all today. Thank you. Shall we any last last words from you? <laughs> you guys all summed up really well. Uh, I think I have a lot of faith in India, especially now that actually offers a lot of opportunity for the world to get to know India better too. So I'm really excited for that future. Well, on that note, I think we can uh, conclude uh, this conference. Thank you so much uh, to all the panelists. I think there were some great ideas shared uh, today, and I think what we've also seen is resilience of some industries, and of course. the industries which will be resilient which will be able to sort of come out of the pandemic faster will also be the ones who will take the lead in the next india's phase of growth so thank you very much for joining us for the session once again and it was lovely talking to all of you thank you everyone thank you thank you thank you very much thank you everyone